I'm delighted to see you all here tonight. My name is Sandy Treadway. I'm the librarian of Virginia. And on behalf of all of us from the Library of Virginia, welcome to tonight's program. Uh, I think you'll be very pleased uh, that you came. Our program this evening is titled Virginia LGBTQ Plus Communities, Politics, and Law. Since Virginia's founding, government institutions have shaped the experience of its citizens whose sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, or sex characteristics do not conform to societal expectations. Throughout our history, lawmakers and courts have determined Virginians' right to marry, to become parents, to access health care, and seek legal remedies against discrimination. And their decisions have had a profound impact on LGBTQ plus Virginians. <clears throat> Tonight, our panel of speakers will discuss Virginia's LGBTQ plus history through the lens of law and government and address the importance of these voices, LGBTQ plus voices, being present and heard in the state's civic institutions. We've got an absolutely phenomenal panel tonight um, to address this topic. So I'm gonna start furthest uh, to my left, your right, and work our way this way. So seated at the end there is Jeff Trammell. Trammell has been involved in politics and activism and higher education for three decades. He was senior advisor to Al Gore in the 2000 presidential campaign, organizing the first LGBTQ component in a presidential campaign ever. He played a similar role for John Kerry in 2004 um, when he ran for the presidency. He's a former co-chair of the Victory Fund, a board member of the Human Rights Campaign, and a member of the Board of Advisors of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. It's Gay and Lesbian Remembrance Project. He's an advisor to the Mattachine Society of Washington as well. He was a member of the Board of Visitors of William & Mary, where he was elected rector in 2011, becoming the first openly gay chair of the board of a major public university. He served as a trustee of the Association of Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges. He's a former trustee of the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation and a current member of the Board of Visitors of Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, so we know he loves history. Um, he has worked for the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives as well. And this is one of the favorite, my favorite facts that he shared with us. Um, he and his husband, Stuart Serkin, were married by retired Supreme, Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor in the U.S. Supreme Court in 2013. She's one of my absolute idols. So seated next to Jeff is Aurora Higgs, who is a black queer history and a visionary and activist based here in Richmond, Virginia. She works as an equity consultant all around the world. She transitioned in 2018 and uses her platform to promote justice and equity. Her day job, she's the VP of Operations at Human Incorporated, a Seattle-based firm specializing in DEI and management consulting for large tech and biopharma corporate clients. In 2019, she founded Borealis Consultancy, where she works as a speaker, researcher, performer, and producer of media that elevates the queer BIPOC voices. She was also invited to assist Delegate um, uh, Danica Rahm in Virginia's House of Delegates in passing several pieces of legislation related to transgender rights in Virginia. Her work in the Richmond community has earned her a number of honors in recent years. She was, featured, she was a featured honoree in Style Weekly's 2019 Top 40 Under 40, as well as the Virginia Museum of History and Culture's Agents of Change exhibit. The advocate named Aurora a 2022 champion of pride from around the US. And if you ever find yourself on MacArthur Avenue in Richmond, you can find a mural in honor of Aurora Higgs and her impact on the community. So next to Aurora is Kathleen Rhodes, who is a master lecturer 
in the Department of Women's and Gender Studies at Old Dominion University, where she has trained students in queer oral history collections, created the region's first student-led queer walking tour series, and helped develop ODU's new queer studies minor. In 2015, Rhodes founded the Tidewater Queer History Project and has since built Tidewater's largest digital repository of local queer history and physical archive of historical objects. She recently worked with a small team of ODU faculty and staff and students to create an immersive virtual reality experience that recreates local LGBTQ spaces from the past. She also serves as Director of Gay Cultural Studies at ODU, an initiative that supports LGBTQ research and creative projects among students and faculty. In addition to her uh, teaching work and community activism, Rhodes provides LGBTQ consulting services and training sessions to Hampton Roads businesses and organizations to create a more inclusive and welcoming environment for LGBTQ citizens. And last, but definitely not least, because he serves as the chair of my library board, so um, I'm a big, uh, big fan, uh, is, is Paul Brockwell, Jr., who is moderating our panel tonight. Paul is the Associate Director of Communications at the MCV Foundation, where he writes and edits for several magazines centered on philanthropic impact and research excellence at the VCU Health Campus. Prior to this role, he was senior communications strategist with the State Corporation Commission and worked nearly six years in higher education communications at the University of Richmond, where his writing earned recognition from the Council for Advancement and Support of Education and the Public Relations Society of America. Paul earned his bachelor's degree at William & Mary and his master's from, in public communications from Newhouse School at Syracuse. And in the community, as I mentioned before, he volunteers here with the library board and serves uh, as our board chair and also is a member of the Library of Virginia Foundation Board. He's moderator at Grace Baptist Church and a secretary to the board of the Sophia Theological Seminary. Libraries have always been important places in Paul's life ever since his mom frequently took him uh, to the Meharan Regional Public Library in Southside, Virginia to load up on books and hear stories. And since his appointment to the library board, he has been a passionate um, advocate for libraries of all kinds, and this library in particular. He lives in East End of Richmond with his husband, Kevin, and Cody, their curmudgeonly Maltese mix, who I've seen on Zoom, and I would say that's an accurate description. <laughs> So I have just a few housekeeping, just two quick housekeeping reminders uh, before I turn the, the um, evening over to Paul and our panelists. Please, if you haven't done it already, pull out that cell phone and turn the ringer off if you wouldn't mind. And at the end of the program, we will, we will be opening the floor to questions and we will we'll have um, a staff member on each of the aisles with a microphone. You don't have to get up and go to the microphone. They will pass it uh, to you. I would just ask that you um, phrase whatever you're thinking in the form of a question. And if you have longer comments you'd like to share with the panel that you save them till after the program when I'm sure they'd be delighted um, to have a conversation with you. So with that, I will sit down, and Paul, and all of you, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you for the warm introduction. And what she didn't mention is that one of the greatest privileges of serving as chair of the library board is the opportunity to work with her regularly. Uh, so I appreciate that, and thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, before we begin, I also want to share a few notes. Uh, first, a confession. There were some incredibly talented and exciting luminaries the library approached about moderating tonight's panel. Unfortunately, none of them were available. <laughs> Um, we're hoping that Oprah will be able to join next year. <laughs> Secondly, I want to share my sincere gratitude to the library staff, particularly to the programming committee, for dreaming up the idea for this event and their work on a recently published LGBTQ plus research guide. Um, I know that there are some members from the programming committee here tonight. If, if staff, if you could please stand, I want to make sure we give you a round of applause. Thank you. I also want to give a shout out to our, our facilities folks and, and those helping make sure that the spaces are as welcoming as the library is. 
And um, we have a great program planned tonight with the goal of highlighting LGBTQ plus in the history in the Commonwealth and also talking about the process of how history gets made, remembered, and preserved. I hope we'll pique your curiosity with some of what your panelists will share and that will leave you eager to discover more about using the library's resources or contribute your own stories to the library's collection and historical items to the cause of collecting the new Virginia. I wanted to offer a few framing comments before I let our panelists shine. One is that I'm really grateful to the library for convening us here tonight. Some days it can be very daunting to think about how difficult it is to engage in civil dialogue on complex topics in today's world. But I'm very hopeful that tonight we can learn a little together and build an appreciation for the complicated and underreported histories of queer folks in the Commonwealth. The term erasure is often appropriate to describe why more is not documented or known about the lives of LGBTQ plus Virginians. And yet, from the margins, the footnotes, the court cases, and through those surviving the AIDS epidemic and how it ravaged vibrant communities of support, we can see the stories of individuals whose identities and struggles intersect with those alive today. It's a much longer history than most appreciate. Take, for instance, the Captain Richard Cornish, who was put to death in 1625 for allegedly homosexual acts with one of his male stewards. Four years later, the 1629 case of Thomasine confounded fellow citizens and concerns about their dressing alternately as a man or a woman led to protracted attempts to Hall's employ uh, by Hall's employers, neighbors, and the colonial government to determine their true sex. In the process of hearing that case, the court inadvertently created a remarkable document that preserves the voice of a gender nonconforming intersex person in the 1620s Virginia. This story is explored more in one of several articles written by library staff. Um, and as we mark October celebration of LGBTQ History Month, we also know that the archives must be interpreted more broadly when documenting the lives of underrepresented or historically marginalized folks. We'll use that term tonight in a way that channels the range of possible meanings from organized and orderly boxes of records to oral histories to stories just passed down from generation to generation and community memory. And that's because there's so much more LGBTQ plus history that isn't captured in traditional archives, which is one of many reasons why events like tonight's are important. Also, I was reminded of work I did around a decade ago that helped shed light on similar history at William & Mary, William Mary's campus, that there are different challenges to finding and understanding this history and accessing how, how you preserve that. Thankfully, our library is a great starting place for folks. Um, interested in learning more about court cases that have helped advance the legal rights of queer individuals. Before Obergefell, there were lesser known cases that advanced uh, the rights of individuals. In the 70s, a federal court forced our Commonwealth, or the Board of Visitors at VCU to be more specific, to provide organizational funding and resources for the Gay Student Alliance. In the 1990s, a case from Alexandria, joined by alumni, an alumni group at William & Mary, led to the federal court striking down anti-gay ABC regulations in Virginia that made it unlawful to serve alcohol to, quote, known homosexuals or to grant liquor licenses to establishments where known homosexuals were known to congregate. Now think about that for a moment. Before 1991, it would have been illegal to grant an ABC license to serve alcohol at tonight's gathering. Before you get too excited, I should tell you that we did not avail ourselves of that opportunity this evening, <laughs> but we invite you to enjoy responsibly at home. I'll also put in a plug for the excellent research guide that recently was published and developed here at the library for anyone who's eager to dig further into the legal and political history. Our very whip-smart team of reference librarians and staff had developed the guide that can point you in the direction of some primary and secondary sources related to some of the topics discussed here tonight. And I'm told that there are zines available with a quick read code for attendees to take tonight if they're interested in getting a quick access to the archive. All right, finally, and at the risk of mixing some metaphors and mangling some metaphors, in the grand tradition of the 1990 film Paris is Burning and by way of RuPaul, I'm going to say the library has always been and is officially open. So let's spill some tea, shall we? I want to begin by asking each of our panelists to share about their work to help document and preserve LGBTQ plus history, how they got engaged in this work, and once they've shared a little bit about their background, I have a few more questions we'll, we'll work through before we open it up for audience questions. So um, let's start with uh, Kathleen from Hampton Roads. 
Okay, um, let's see. I trace the way that I got interested in this or involved in this to my own personal story. So I grew up in Virginia, I'm a lifelong Virginian. Uh, I feel like I should get an award for that. I've never lived in any state other than Virginia. Um, even went to college in Virginia. Um, and I moved to Norfolk, I was working at ODU, and I wanted to know what the queer history was in that area. I didn't know any of it. I was teaching um, queer studies, but I didn't know really what it was, um, what that history was locally. And I talked to my friend Marge Reed, who I met through my partner Robin, um, many years ago, and I was telling her, I'm just so interested, and. Um, a woman by the name of Shirley Pritchard had just recently passed away, and Shirley owned a lesbian bar in Norfolk, and I, I knew that much because I had heard a lot about her. Um, and so I was kind of, you know, complaining to Marge, like, somebody needs these stories. They need to capture these stories before people are gone, and we can't get them anymore. And she said, you should do it. And I thought, I have no idea how to do that. Um, and here we are. Um, so thanks to Marge, um, who always is one of those people who's like, just go do the thing. And um, I've kind of been doing the thing since then. <clears throat> Excuse me. A lot of my work um, involves students at ODU, um, and um, about uh, let's see, I, I guess about eight years ago at this point is when I started the Tidewater Queer History Project. That was kind of my formal way of saying, "Okay, I'm going to do this work." And I started with Marge. She was the first oral history interview that I did. Um, and then I got students involved in that process, and we developed a walking tour so that every year I had a new group of students, they found their interest in the community, and, um, and we created this walking tour. Each one had a spot on the tour, and they would create a tour and invite the community to it. Um, and that was really wonderful. Um, the last time we did that in person was in 2019, of course, because of COVID. That one was a particularly fun walking tour, though, because we had people in the audience who took the megaphone over. So we got to this one bar, the garage in uh, downtown Norfolk, and there's a couple. They're both named Joe, Joe and Joe. Um, they're called the Joes. One of the Joes, after the students had given this like really great presentation about the leather scene at the garage, which was the name of the bar, one of the Joes said, can I have the megaphone? And he like holds it up and he's like, this is where Joe and I met. And he tells their story of how they met at the garage for the first time. So it was a really wonderful kind of um, community and student interaction that we got on those walking tours. And then uh, during COVID, uh, we had to switch gears some, and um, we, we did our first walking tour in, or during COVID on Zoom. And then after that, I thought we should really figure out a way to do this in some other kind of way other than just face-to-face. -face. Because face-to-face is wonderful, but it has limitations. Um, it's hard, it was long, first of all. So some people have a hard time doing a three hour walking tour. Um, the downtown streets of Norfolk, um, there was often construction. Sometimes they're a little uneven. Probably there are some streets like that in Richmond. Um, and so it, it just posed some actual physical challenges for people. We were only doing it once a year. And that's how I, um, I got interested in a virtual reality tour. And so what we did with that tour is we've recreated three sites in Virginia Beach, actually, in um, collaboration with the Virginia Beach Historic Preservation Commission to build visually um, preserve through these three virtual reality sites, um, three historical sites in are uh, from the city. Sites and events, one of them was more an event um, than a uh, that an actual place. Um, so, I don't know, maybe that was, that was great. too much or, <laughs> no, that was it's great. hard to stop talking about queer history because it's, yeah. <laughs> no, that's great. Aurora, tell us more about your journey. Um, yeah, hey everyone, my name's Aurora Higgs, she, pronouns are she, her, and they, them. Um, how I got into this work, it's another, I, I, hesitate to even start because I know I'm just going to go down the rabbit hole because it just feels like a lot of 
disjointed um, events in my life that sort of just led me here. And a lot of it just has to do with the fact that as queer people who are, all of us are queer people on the stage, we know what it's like to be erased from history. And in a world where so many people have the ability to trace back their ancestors, their, um, their forebearers, it becomes that much more that much more of a glaring absence when you can't trace your your history back. And and for queer people, we often don't do it genetically. We do it through legacy. And so, but on top of that, I'm black, right? And so n not only do queer people, have queer people been erased from history, black people have been erased from history, and black people have, black queer people have been erased from queer history. So in a lot of ways, I constantly felt that history was is supposed to be this place where you find yourself, where you answer the questions that, that contemporary life can't answer for you. And I felt that much more disproportionately disadvantaged when it comes to tracing back uh, what I say my transcestors, um, or really just the legacies that, that um, led me here. And um, I have always been interested in storytelling. I'm I'm an, I'm a storyteller. That's what I do, and um, in a, in some ways, I think of we're all history makers. And but when I think about storytelling in general, I think of that as being as making history in that moment. I'm I'm sharing these stories, um, her stories, if you will. Uh, again, to take another RuPaulism. Um, and so I decided uh, when it was time for me to look at PhD programs, I was going to go into uh, an interdisciplinary field. That way I could take a little bit of sociology, take a little bit of performance art, take a little bit of queer and gender um, uh, studies and incorporate this into me knitting back the holes um, that were that were left for me when I went to look back at my history. So I come to this work as somebody who is a black trans femme and who is often faced with the fact that, again, not just queer people, not just black people, but also women and femmes in history are often erased. And so the work is that much harder for me, but it's, almost, it's also that much more rewarding when you find something, you stumble upon something in the archive, or you find, um, uh, I studied archeology span and anthropology very, uh, as soon as I got into undergrad and at William and & Mary. And um, I didn't stay at William & Mary, but that was, I was already, I had already been bitten by the bug. I was interested in human culture, human history, but mostly I'm interested in the intersection of black blackness and queerness, um, history and disrespectability. I think those things, again, to keep adding to the intersections of erasure, things that are taboo, things that are not um, discussed in polite society are, are oftentimes erased from history. And I find so much strength and power in specifically looking through the lens of the taboo, specifically looking for disrespectability, looking at how sex work um, existed in, in the past, looking at how um, body performance art, and B-A-W-D-E-D-Y, to use a, a 20s, uh, <laughs> early 19th century term, but uh, these, these um, areas where every um, every part of society has tried to suppress and they still live on um, despite that, I think is so wildly fascinating. And I think that there's so much that we can learn about uh, the world through disrespectability because we know now so many things have been deemed taboo, talking about race, talking about gender, um, the specific uh, gender roles in our society, those things used to be uh, people who went against the, the current and the grain in those areas were seen as being without worth or not being respectable. And we know now that that's not true. So what other truths can we find when we look through history and we look through the archive and we look specifically for the disrespectable? Um, and so as somebody who is stubborn as hell, as somebody who is raised in um, 
a household, a matriarchal household. My, I had both parents in the household, but it was definitely a femme-dominated household. Um, I was always taught to push the envelope, to go where I'm not supposed to go, to ask questions I'm not supposed to ask, and do things I'm not supposed to do as long as they're not hurting anybody. And so that is that pretty much sums up how I look at history and, and the reasons why I look for history, because I think that there are still things in today's society we don't allow ourselves to talk about, we hide or relegate to the shadows that have very real value, that um, could teach us something about our past and our, and our futures, and then by virtue of that about our present. Um, I'm also a big fan of Jose Esteban Munoz and their um, uh, idea of radical hope and futurism and um, utopianism. So um, all of these things come together and, and uh, influence my interest in history and this work. Thank you. And Jeff, I know you've been really instrumental in creating an archive at William & Mary of, for legal and political history. How did you get involved in this work? What, what's been your driving passion for this? Well, thanks, Paul. First of all, it's a privilege to be on the panel tonight with Rory and Kathleen and you and Sandy. Uh, thank you. Um, look, here's the reality. We, we have lived in interesting times, right? We have seen change in the world. Many of us are, and those of us who are a little older, have, have lived through from the complete and utter um, just terror of the 50s, although I have to admit I was barely around. Uh, but when people were fired routinely from jobs everywhere, they were in prison. California, they were put in mental hospitals. I mean, the stories are horrendous. Are they part of American history? No, by and large not. Okay, so as we've gotten involved in trying to protect ourselves and advance our community's interest, we have been very much engaged in the political system, in higher education, and many other, in, in libraries, in community activism. Um, and so for the first time in our history, we're out there. There, in the old days, the only records was when we were arrested, right? And so there were only court records before or diaries that were found, a few things like that. But starting really in the, the, in the 50s and 60s, we started leaving paper. We started writing things. We started making picket signs. Well, thank God my friend Charles Francis went to Frank Kameny's house talked him into emptying his attic out of hundreds of boxes from, of stuff from the 50s and the picket signs that were carried in front of the White House in 1964 by some very brave people like Barbara Gidding and Frank Kameny and others. Those are now in the American History of, uh, Museum of the Smithsonian and all of Frank's papers are in the Library of Congress. Now, this is you know the love that dare not speak its name, right? Well, we're speaking it pretty loudly now. And we're all part of that, because we're living it. We're the, we're the folks who, for the first time, are part of society generally, and generally accepted, with a lot of work to be done yet. But the point is, we look around and we say, well, what about those older people in our community? They did great work. Where are their papers? What will future scholars do? I remember a couple here in Richmond that some of you may have known, uh, John Cook and Waverly Cole. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you knew them, but uh, they lived up at uh, Westminster, Canterbury. And I would come see them occasionally. And John told me, John was a veteran of World War II. He was a uh, Normandy invasion, went on to be uh, a higher ed official here in Virginia. And his husband, although I don't think they, they never legally got married because they couldn't in those days, Waverly Cole was a doctor at MCV. So John told me that in 1957 he was in Crewe, Virginia, not away County, and he heard there was this new young doctor in town. And he said, I made it my business to get to know him. He was cute. And he made his way over and got to talk to him and decided that that was going to be his life partner. And it happened, as fate would have it. He said, by next weekend, our, we were on our way to the beach together. Well, this was 1957. Can you imagine? Now, I don't know if anyone did an oral history with John and Waverly. I have no idea. 
Hopefully someone did. But they were, uh, they would come up to D.C. and, uh, you know, go to worthy human rights campaign dinner or service members national, national defense uh, uh, dinner to help uh, people in the military, stuff like that. But here they were really sort of low-key in Richmond. Uh, but you think about those people, right, and what their lives were like and what happened to their papers. What happened to the love notes they wrote to each other and were kept in, in shoe boxes? Another thing that got me interested, uh, during the litigation over same-sex marriage, um, the, um, the court said, lower court said, you have to prove that there's been animus toward this community for you to have a, a cause of action. Well, we all laugh at that animus toward us. Any one of us could talk about the animus we've experienced in our lifetimes. But for the general straight public, it was like, oh, you guys have got it easy. You know, nothing wrong. You haven't experienced the animus, which is an ongoing issue of educating people. But my friends who work in the Mattachine Society dug through the files. They found the letter from the Civil Service Commission head to Frank Kameny when he was uh, a leader in D.C. trying to help federal employees not get fired. And they, they said, no one wants to work with a homosexual. They are uniquely nasty. And this was a letter signed by the head of the U.S. Civil Service Commission. They got that entered in the record. It went all the way to the court. It was one of the foundational documents that helped us win Obergefell. We had proof of animus from the U.S. federal government. How dare anyone say there wasn't animus? Well, what if we hadn't had that paper? It would just been our word, right? So documents are so important. And sometimes we get caught up in the day-to-day day -day activities and forget about that. Now, I had a guy work for me a few years ago say, young guy I just hired out of William & Mary. I'm sorry to say William & Mary so much. But uh, he said, you know, someone told me there used to be gay neighborhoods in D.C. And I thought, oh, my God. The world has changed in five or ten years. Everyone sort of lives together now. But this guy doesn't know that, about gay neighborhoods. And he said, why would people live together like that? And I said, for safety. <laughs> the world had changed so fast that this bright young guy did not understand what his life was like in the 90s. Okay? That made me sort of raise an eyebrow and think, my gosh, what will future generations know about what happened, you know, in the fight at VCU? What will happen? I mean, where, where are, uh, you know, um, Adam Evans' papers going, or Tracy Thorne Beglin, or a lot of other people like that who made history, right? That's the reason we have to have archives. At William & Mary, what we did was we, we um, had um, the Mattachine Society of Washington uh, decide to donate their papers to William & Mary to the John Boswell uh, uh, Archive. It's an archive of national LGBT political and legal history. John uh, Boswell was a 1969 graduate of William & Mary. He went on to uh, get his PhD at Harvard and then taught at Yale. And he wrote a couple of foundational books about Christianity and same-sex unions in the Middle Ages. And he was brilliant, spoke 17 languages when most of us you know, struggle to speak one. And uh, Boswell found evidence that there were blessings of same-sex unions, not marriage necessarily, but at least some acknowledgement and recognition, which was groundbreaking. Uh, Evan Wolfson, who was head of Freedom to Marry and got, all, got a Burgerfell adopted, basically. He said, had it not been for the academic work, the books written by John Boswell, there would not be freedom to marry in the U.S. today. And, uh, you know, John Boswell was someone who's, who wrote his books based on the archives in Europe. He was able to read in the original Greek and Latin, God forbid. Uh, so the point just is, if you see anyone Throwing stuff away, stop them. <laughs> <laughs>
please, no garbage bags full of junk that needs to be thrown out from that pride celebration 14 years ago. Please. <laughs> you know, send it to Paul and Sandy and let them look at it first and they'll decide if it's worthless. But uh, things we think are, everybody knows or understands. Yes, there used to be gay neighborhoods. I'm sorry if you're 23 or 4 and don't, under, don't know that. But there did used to be in the big cities for safety reasons. Uh, perfect example that unless we save our history, unless we tell our stories, they will be lost to future generations. So at William and Mary, we're doing an awful lot of oral interviews. We, I told them earlier the story of this woman we found who's incredible. Night, uh, uh, Zona Hostetler, she's now 87. She grew up in Charles City County, very poor family. Uh, and she got a scholarship to William and Mary, graduated in 1957, which means, of course, she was white because there were only white people at William and Mary in 1957, sadly. Um, she, got a, she went to Harvard Law School, first woman to go to Harvard Law School, and um, came back, got a job in D.C., took this pro bono client named Frank Kameny in the Mattachine Society, defended them before Congress, before the courts in D.C., she was 26, 27 years old and pregnant with her first child and did all this. And no one really knew about it. Well, thank God we found her and did oral interviews with her. We've done a number of them. And um, she has large bags of material we have forced her not to throw out. So we're hopeful we can go through that. That's my view of why we have to all work together to save the history we have lived and those before us lived. Otherwise, there is so little on us anyway that we're erased. And that's not accurate history. I mean, we are American history. That's all I got. Thank you. And he made mention of Frank Kameny. For those of you who are not familiar, he was a, a federal um, an astronomer with the federal government who was fired uh, for, for being gay, um, but actually in the, it was in the late 50s or early 60s, contested his firing in court, which is rare for the time. That's right, uh, 1957, and it went all the way to, he wrote his own writ of certiorari to the U.S. Supreme Court, first time that the court had ever been faced with the question of could someone be, be fired for being gay. I mean, there are those who have said, perhaps with a little hyperbole, but that he's our Rosa Parks. You know, there are, a, a, he refused to, to do what they told him to do. They messed with the wrong person when they messed with Frank Kameny from Brooklyn. <laughs> he fought them tooth and nail the rest of his life. And, and there's a great um, book about his life that recently came out in the last three years called The Deviant's yeah. War, uh, right. which is the first major book project about, about him as a historical figure. Um, well, next I want to ask you, kind of looking back through the work of, of your research and your, your knowledge of history, what are some of the things that have you found most fascinating as you've done this work and you've documented uh, queer history or, or researched particular issues in the archive? Um, I can say that, I mean, it depends on the, on the scope and scale that you're looking at, of course. I think that there's really interesting um, global history when it comes to queer people, black uh, queer people, or queer people of color, um, in nationally, and even in Richmond. I think one bit, tidbit that I find really fascinating is the ties between um, gay clubs here in Richmond in the, I want to say the 70s, maybe 80s, um, and the mafia. Um, and because, again, this is this is me looking through um, the lens of disrespectability, is that oftentimes when you find yourself on the margins, um, and it's the difference between being erased or being or surviving, you do what you have to to survive. And sometimes that means <clears throat> partnering up with organized crime, um, which hey, uh, be gay do crime, um, and. Uh, there, it's just really interesting to find that when the quote unquote legitimate sources of um, or legitimate institutions were unwilling to um, work with or partner with the queer community that you go with illegitimate sources. And so the gay clubs found themselves um, being run 
and or um, you know bounced, if you will, by um, people who had ties to the um, to certain mafia groups or to mafiosos, and um, and it's really cool. It's kind of badass. Like I, I think that that is. And again, all in an effort to survive. We're not just talking about like doing that just to, to take over the world or to do crime um, just for the sake of it. It was to create spaces that were safe for people because um, you had, just like at, at the Stonewall Inn in New York, you had um, police officers coming in and entrapping some of the, um, the club goers here or you had, um, you know, some of the clubs had to maybe bribe the police forces in order to keep uh, police riots at bay. And I just think it's, I, I am constantly fascinated by thinking of what it looks like for, I believe his, the mafioso, and I've used this, I'm gonna use that term um, loosely here. Um, I think his name was Leo Corey here in Richmond, if I'm correct, okay. okay. Uh, yeah, and um, how he was a straight man, um, again, we'll never really know, but this was purported straight man um, running gay clubs in Richmond because it was a source of money for him and because he being a person with experiences of organized crime and illegitimacy um, was had the means to run a another, um, a, an institution that was meant for a niche group of people that were similarly um, uh, vilified by, you know, police or institutions. Now, again, I say all of this to say I'm, I say all of this with the caveat that, you know, they were not so much ill, they were not so much bad or illegitimate as they were just facing bias from a, 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 the police force in, in society, which had unnecessary biases. And so they had every right to survive, and they did what they could. And I just love thinking about that and what other um, unsavory partnerships had to happen and occur um, in order to for us to survive in the ways that we have. Thank you. And we know from the, the court cases in Virginia that, that no known homosexual could be granted a liquor license. So it, like you said, survivability. Um, uh, speaking of, of bars, Kathleen, I was wondering if you could share anything from your research in Tidewater, knowing that you've recreated some of these spaces in virtual reality. I have a mafia story. <laughs> mafia story. Yes, and I just learned this recently. I have been listening to interviews that were conducted in 1999 and 2000 by James Sears. He wrote a book called Rebels, Ruby Fruit, and Rhinestones. Um, if you've never heard of that book, it has a lot of Richmond history in it, um, but it also has a lot of Hampton Roads history. It's all about um, the queer South. and. Um, so I've been listening to the interviews that he did with people from Hampton Roads, and he did one with Steve Brown, who owned a bar called The Pantry. Um, and Steve tells the whole story of like how the bar got started. And he inherited it basically from his parents. Um, they had a bar called The Tuxedo. Apparently, a lot of lesbians used to come into The Tuxedo. I don't know why, um, but they did, and because it was a straight bar. But um, so his parents passed away and his brother actually inherited the bar, but his brother lived in Utah. And um, so Steve uh, was like, uh, Steve was still in the area and something happened. Like the manager stopped taking his brother's phone calls for weeks at a time. And so Steve stops by one day um, at his brother's request. And of course, uh, I think we can all see this coming. The bar was closed. There was a bunch of bills on the uh, counter that he hadn't paid, hadn't paid taxes, all this kind of stuff. So um, Steve gets everything paid up and he tells his brother, I'll run the bar for you, but it's gonna be a gay bar. In fact, he said in the interview, I'd worked with straight people before and I wasn't interested in doing it again. So he knew he wanted a gay bar, right? <clears throat> and there were lots of gay bars in um, Norfolk at the time, in the 70s. This was uh, 1975. And, um, uh, but he opened it up as the pantry, renamed it the pantry. Um, it was, uh, uh, he called it a sports bar, but what he meant was uh, there were sporty gay men who came to the bar. Because um, the interview, I loved it, the interviewer was like, well, usually a sports bar has like TVs and stuff like that. What was a sports bar in this? I wouldn't know what those are like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, so he's running the bar and uh, it gets raided pretty soon after uh, he had opened it as the pantry. And 
come to find out when he was doing sort of his paperwork, um, he said to them, well, I'm running it for my brother. My brother lives in Utah. And he said, basically, it just sounded kind of sketchy to them. They thought he was a front for the mafia. He actually wasn't. What he says in the interview is, I should have told them my brother's a Mormon, because he was. Um, so, you know, you've got this guy running a gay bar for his Mormon brother who lives in Utah, um, but the police just assumed that he had um, mafia connections. In that raid, seven men were arrested. Their names were printed in the newspaper, um, as was common all across the United States. So there were real repercussions um, to that. So, you know, it's kind of mafia adjacent, I guess. Um, yeah. That's awesome. What about you, Jeff? You know, I think much of society does not understand this that we're talking about here, the, 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 the demi monde, if you will, the, the, the part of society that is hidden mm -hmm. in the margins. If, if, if you're LGBTQ, you know about that. From your earliest awareness, you were trying to figure out where the hell do I fit in, right? You're struggling with it. And you know you don't fit over here and you try to manage that as you're growing up and you're figuring out who you are. And this over here has always been around. We've always been there. You know, I'm a trustee of Colonial Williamsburg. What do we, the only thing I can tell you is there were, we were there. <laughs> we don't have evidence of it. I can't, you know, come to the Library of Virginia and pull out the folder on Jamestown and it talks about queer people or, or Williamsburg. We do have a few examples of people in the, that the courts had to deal with. That seems to be the only time where we're noteworthy is when we're being hauled before somebody. Um, but what do you do in that situation, right? They, there was no one there who did oral histories. There, no one kept papers of people that showed uh, same gender relationships, we know they existed. We know that there were ways that people communicated with each other. We've been there through history, always. We know that. Those of us who lived it because it's the most natural thing in the world. So we are. We see the world through that lens. I think one of the things I have found personally most fascinating is get to knowing people who are different than I am but yet have that same experience. It's a heck of a thing to be able to feel that same exclusion and marginalization. Here I am, you know, a white guy, 6'7", former college basketball player, okay? What do I have in common? I have a lot more in common with them than I do with a lot of the other players out there. Mm -hmm. Took me a while to realize that. But I, I sort of knew it from an early age. I wasn't interested in going off hunting and fishing and chasing girls. So dribble to basketball to keep, keep myself busy. But um, I have been fascinated by this, this idea of the more, we're trying to, as historians and archivists, we're trying to capture this part of society and our history, right? It's not easy. We've got some great teachers who show people around, this is the way it was. I wish I had something in Williamsburg, I could walk people around it, but we don't have anything, okay? Uh, but our job is to bring to light this part of American history. And it's really just fascinating to think about that, isn't it? There's been this parallel universe always. And we've been out there in every different race, gender permutation. We're there. You know, they may say we're not there in Iran. The Ayatollah may say, well, there are no homosexuals in Iran, of course, right? We all roll our eyes. But we're everywhere, and we're in a parallel universe. And part of our job, it, we, we're so fortunate we live at a time when it doesn't have to be parallel anymore, right? We're the ones who are helping educate, open opportunities for the future. But, that, but the work to do that is knowledge-based, and knowledge comes from libraries. It comes from museums. And that's the reason we're 
deeply indebted to the Library of Virginia for, for the important work you're doing. Thank you. You've each alluded to the, the challenges of, of preserving history, both because it's, it's being literally torn down in the way of structures or closed down, or, um, or, or you need it to inform some of your present day advocacy. I was wondering if each of you could talk to why this work is so important, the documenting and the researching, the political and legal history, especially now. I uh, have a lot of conversations with students. Um, and first of all, Jeff, I have to tell you, you reminded me that um, I just found out, it was maybe a year or two ago, that 20-year-olds uh, don't know what family is. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, because I, I was, I think I was showing them um, a bumper sticker that was donated, um, and it said family pride, and they were all just kind of blank-faced. And I was like, do you know what it means? And they had no idea. Um, just like the neighborhoods that you were talking about, and like oh oh oh, yeah, oh, that, oh is she family or, or are they family? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a way of like creating your own community for people whose actual blood family um, might very well have um, cut connections uh, with them, um, and. And so there are lots of things that those students don't know sometimes that, that shocks me because it was so core to my own coming out and my own life. And, um, but what they desperately want, uh, at least the students that I work with, is some kind of connection that gives them a roadmap. So um, how, who even knows at this point if I'll, I'll give you a candy bar if anybody can tell us how many anti-trans bills there have been this year I mean there are so many do you know are you about to tell me I, I it's about oh god it, I don't it, have a candy bar uh, the la <laughs> no. I think the I think the ACLU last I checked, which was maybe about a month ago, four hundred and ninety one, but that's probably an underestimation. So it's yeah. probably closer to five. I'd say b between 490 and 515 ish. See, I need two candy bars for you now, Aurora. Yeah, it's an insane number. And so those students come into the classroom with this really heavy weight on their shoulders. And they're just like looking out around them. And I think in a lot of ways, they, they aren't really prepared for it in the way that some of us who are older than them have been prepared for it because we lived through different times. Um, and so they need some information. Like they need no, to know how to get through their everyday lives. And just even if, you know, nothing's directly happening to them. Jeff, you, what was it you said earlier? You're like, we all know what that feels like. Um, and so it's something that you carry with you every day, even if, if, if no one's, even if someone's not saying something to you. Um, that's really horrible. Um, and this history provides that for them. So I have been shocked at how similar, because I've uh, done a lot of presentations recently, I don't know why, about Anita Bryant. And um, so she came to the Norfolk Scope, uh, like I'm sure she was in Richmond. She was, on at, her... she was at U of R actually yeah. uh, in the 70s. Uh, that's, that's Jeff's home state friend, Anita Bryant from Florida. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but do you claim Anita Bryant? <laughs> um, but on her new creation crusade, which if you aren't familiar with that, um, Anita Bryant, who was famous for her orange juice commercials, um, really took up anti-homophobia as her new job and uh, went on what she actually called a crusade through the United States. And as I've been talking about it in terms of Norfolk history, it's just so similar to conversations about groomers and um, this anti-gay, anti-trans rhetoric that we hear from people um, that we're all out there just like waiting for little children to walk by so we can grab them. Um, and that was 40 years ago. So if we um, can do this history and understand how people like what people did, I, I don't, maybe we need to throw more pies in faces. I don't know, that's, uh, um, that's. I don't even have candy bars here tonight. I know, <laughs> um, but uh, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that I think that younger people really need this information so that they see that people have dealt with similar things before, very similar, um, shockingly and depressingly similar things. Uh, 
and that one, they rose to the challenge and they did stuff about it um, in their very own communities. And also that they got through it because sometimes when you're you know, 20 years old, that can feel like it's going to be very difficult to do. So they're kind of um, a big motivator for me. Thank you. Anyone else on that? Why is it so important, especially now? Well, I think it's easy after you've had success to sit back and rest. Obergefell happened, the big one, of course, was Lawrence v. Texas in 2003, when they made all of us who are, have same-sex attraction no longer felons, which we were prior to that. It's, it's hard to believe that those law, as late as 2003, people were subject to arrest for having same-sex relationships. But that was true. And um, Sandra Day O'Connor was on the right side of that, that five to four decision in 2003, and we were most appreciative. In fact, when I uh, became rector and I went in to see her in her office in the Supreme Court, I kept debating, as all of us do, I was nervous as I could be, of course, and I was thinking, okay, I'll talk to her about William and Mary. Do I dare thank her for Lawrence v. Texas? And then I thought about Scalia and said, I have to. <laughs> um, and I did at the end of our conversation about higher education, because she was our chancellor at the time at William and Mary, which is an honorary position, and she was no longer officially on the bench, so she could be chancellor. <clears throat> and I said to her, uh, Justice O'Connor, I just want to thank you for Lawrence v. Texas and making my husband and me no longer felons in our own country. And she smiled big and didn't say uh, too much, but I could tell she liked, uh, she was proud of that decision. Um, the, um, I think it's fascinating when you think about the fact that now people are coming after us, right? And they say trans is the easy target first. Let's not think for a second they won't go after marriage in a heartbeat, the same way they went after uh, choice. Uh, the people who put together the whole strategy for getting the Dobbs decision to overturn Roe have the same thing going on in Texas to try to create a case that would go to the Supreme Court. And no one should trust the five uh, justices who would, I mean, I have no doubt they would vote to, to at least limit, if not overturn, same-sex marriage. Um, so we're in a perilous time. And, uh, you know, we really need to, we're, we're under assault. And they have found, you know, libraries, museums as, as being targets as well. So, you know, we shouldn't have any uh, uh, Pollyanna views that, uh, that we're not under full assault because this community will be marginal. They will push us back as far as they can. These are people that are advocating for the 50s, you know, full speed ahead. Um, so I think that's really important for us to focus on and to, to, uh, to fight back. Wherever we can, we each find our own ways and, and you know, there are people at local level across the country that are fighting for their libraries and fighting to make sure that young people can read literature where they see themselves. You know, we didn't have, most of us didn't have that chance when we were growing up, uh, but we want the next generation to know those things. You know, the documentary, I saw Patrick Salmon the other day who just produced a documentary on when the American Psychological Association in the early 70s overturned their very old uh, conclusion that, uh, quote, homosexuals, which you can use to, you know, the whole spectrum of, of our community, uh, were no longer mentally defective, but that it was a naturally occurring part of society. That was monumental when that happened, and Frank Kameny helped organize that in the early 70s. And, and um, Patrick has done a documentary of it, which he's trying to get into schools, <laughs> uh, and that's going to be his big fight. But now we're in for a huge information fight, and um, you know, we, we uh, one small thing I care deeply about and believe is part of this. As, w as I've watched all this, I've kind of understand that when we have democracy, when we have true debate of ideas and reflect the public, we win. When they gerrymander and rig in certain states and let the small 
religious right control, we lose. When I look at countries like Russia and Turkey and Iran and Hungary, we have no rights in those countries, and they're not democracies. It, it, there's a strong relationship, I've come to understand, between the rights of our community and democracy. You know, when we have democracy, we can stand up and fight and, and push back, and we have achieved our victories through a democratic system. And to the extent that we lose that, I really think that we, we go into a very bad place. I mean, I, th I think we have as much at risk in this fight for democracy as any group in the country. Uh, I, I agree with points that you've both made. Um, I do think that a great litmus test for democracy is to look for <clears throat> systems of marginalization. Number one, if systems of marginalization exist at all, then that's, qu that's reason to question. Um, if, if there is a true, true democracy, and then also looking at the realities of those who are marginalized as, a, as another, um, a similar form of, because it, it, what you're talking about, bias and disenfranchisement, those are slippery slopes, right? And I'm, call it cynical, whatever you wanna call it, I, I am much more of the idea that the people who are up here, you know, the Ron DeSantis, all of these people who are um, making a tirade that is specific to trans communities, I don't even know that I believe that he cares that much about trans people one way or the other. I think that this is a political strategy to, um, to fear monger. And what other way, I mean, we, we've seen this in, um, we saw this in the Holocaust in Germany, um, wherein somebody who wants political power um, pose, creates a problem or, or highlights a, pro a known problem, but creates the uh, pathogen for that problem and says, hey, I uniquely understand what the pathogen is. And then because I uniquely understand what that pathogen is, I, have, I uniquely have the solution for all of your woes and your woes and the typically the woes of the people are not actually connected to this quote unquote pathogen and so then it be, put, gives you a special platform right you now have uh the solution the the nostrum the cure all for everything and people who are um going through hard times people when there's uh, economic downturn when there is uncertainty people look for somebody with the answers to to rescue them I think that that is a known political strategy. And so the people who are out here um, uh, going all, all uh, going on these tirades, like I said, um, against trans people, once, once the agenda, once they've accomplished or failed to reach their goals in that agenda, they'll move on to another, another group. It's a slippery slope. And so the liberation of trans people, of people of color, of people who live with disabilities, um, we're all inextricably tied together and our rights and our realities are inextricably tied to that of um, the larger society. Our oppression, I mean, I'm sorry, liberation trickles upwards. And so if you liberate the people who are the most disenfranchised, you then free up resources and um, ways of living, legitimized ways of living for everyone who experiences less discrimination or bias than those folks. And um, unlike trickle down economics, which does not work, um, you, liberation does in fact trickle up in my, in my mind. And so. I think that all, everything we're talking about is super important for <clears throat> points that were that were made around the fact that we are we're experiencing a, a a pendulum, and it seems that we're going back and forth, back and forth. We, it seems like we already had the the LGBT movement, and we fought super hard, we won certain rights, and now we find ourselves having to um, fight for them again. And I think people talk about time being a circle or a loop, and I think of it more as a spiral, right? A three-dimensionalized um, circle in that, sure, 
there's the pendulum of the left and the right, and sure, we find ourselves going back and forth, left and right, but we're also making progress to upwards, or that's the hope at least. And so I think, though, even though we don't, it's not a loop and we're not exactly where we were um, when the pendulum last shifted, I think that there are things that we can learn, strategies for movement making, strategies for educating people and bringing people in that we can utilize in current movements. Um, I know that right now, it's funny because it actually was just published today in RVA Magazine, there was an article about a film shown at the Richmond International Film Festival over the past weekend called uh, Affirmation Generation. The former title was No Way Back. And it's this whole, it, I mean, it's propaganda. Uh, that's the best word I can, I can think for it. It's propaganda and it's meant to um, uh, fear monger around um, young people and um, medical transitioning and how medical transitioning is just a way of, of mutilating the bodies of, of young people and this, that, and the third. And it's just so wild because what we're really talking about in these conversations when it comes to trans youth is things like puberty blockers and in a way of staving off this bodily process that we don't consent to. but. The way that they talk about it is really interesting because they talk about um, youth being um, subject to a made-up um, illness or a made-up um, phenomenon called rapid onset gender dysphoria, wherein by a child simply seeing a trans person out in the wild, out in the wild, out in society, <laughs> it feels like the wild, right? Um, out in out in society, and then catching the transness and being like, wow, and now that I see that trans person, I'm trans, and I'm gonna make all of these decisions based on this um, flight of fancy, if you will, and I'm gonna do irreparable damage to my body. That's, that's the rhetoric that's used in this film, and this was shown at the Richmond International Film Festival, and just this, just this past week, or two weeks ago, at the, within that time. And so it's important, to your question, it's important that we're having these conversations because we're finding ourselves backtracking in a lot of these ways. And the good thing about backtracking means that we've done it before. We fought these fights before. We still have the weapons, the tools, the strategies that we used, and we can update them to contemporary um, need so that we they can service us. And so by talking about what it meant to create communities, create systems of safety, to um, rage against the machine, if you will, we, it's important that we know those things because those are still viable strategies and for war, for um, survival, for care. And um, I think that in, that in and of itself is really important. But I also think outside of just that, I think it's really important for people to know in the black community, we say this a lot, I am my ancestor's wildest dreams. And I think that that extends beyond the black community. I think it's important for us to understand that we are a part of a legacy. We're connected to something. We're connected to the hopes and the dreams of, of the people that came before us. And we have a legacy that we can leave. We are, may not be long for this earth individually, but the movements and the legacies that we create are longstanding. And unfortunately, that is also true of the bad side. But they're not alone in that privilege. We also have the privilege to pass things on. And it's important not just to safeguard the things that came before us, but to consider every day in contemporary time today is, is history, is the history of tomorrow. So yes, make sure people clean out those attics from, you know, before people throw things away. But Take things like that that you're currently using today. Take, take the stories, record them somewhere. If you millennials out there, if you're um, uh, taking selfies and you're putting IG posts out there into the world, that's history that you're making and feel affirmed in doing that and being the narcissistic like uh, digital millennial or Gen Z. Like, let pe people can tell you that that's all like about vain and frivolous, but you're making history and you're recording it in ways that are long-standing that we didn't have the privilege of having like in the in the 1600s. Those, a lot of those things are ephemeral and go away. So um, there's lots of reasons why this work is important. And I think that um, those are just a couple of examples why. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. And as folks are thinking about coming to the mics, I want to ask our panelists to, to leave us leave us hopeful about What's keeping you hopeful about the future of preserving this history based on your understanding of how far we've come? Well, having spent a lot of my life in the political system, I will look at the fact that 
Uh, yesterday, a black lesbian was sworn in as a senator from California that uh, Danica Rome is going to be elected to the state senate in Prince William County, that Sarah McBride, who is a trans member of the state senate in Delaware, is going to be elected to the U.S. Congress from Delaware, it appears. We, ha we'll ha we have two U.S. senators now who are openly lesbian. We have probably 10 or 11 members of, of the House. In 1998, the first was elected, and that was Tammy Baldwin. And I was involved in the Victory Fund there, and, and we thought we had hung the moon. We elected an openly LGBT, we said gay and lesbian in those days, uh, person to Congress. Well, now it's sort of ho-hum. So, you know, let's not lose sight of the fact that we have the ability to work a democratic system to our advantage. They're trying to stop us from being registered to vote, our opponents are, because they know what we'll do with the right to vote. <laughs> we'll change things. So that's one thing, not to be redundant, but I'm really concerned about us remembering the importance of democ the linkage of democracy to the progress that we have made and can make, perhaps more importantly, in the future. We have to have that seat at the table. What's keeping you hopeful? Um, I think these conversations, events just like these, showing up and the fact that there's anybody in the audience and knowing that um, that we're creating history right now. I was just, you know, just to kind of go back to what I was saying and that that people care and that no matter how much it feels like we're kind of redoing old um, habits, sometimes we're, we do it just to reinforce um, that this is the right call. I think there's a saying that says um, those privileges that are um, hard fought are maintained long. I'm butchering this, but you, we hold on to those um, a lot more um, for, uh, long term uh, compared to those uh, victories that were easily won. And so every time we go through a struggle, I just think that we're just reinforcing, um, you know, the, the cast of the broken limb of our, our culture and our history and, and that we're going to be stronger for it. And um, I'm also very hopeful by um, the younger generation. I'm a millennial. I, every time I witness Gen Z and Gen Alpha out there, just ready to burn it all down, figuratively, figuratively. Um, <laughs> I get so happy and hopeful because it's just a generation that has access to technology that we never had and is also says that this is not good enough. So um, when I see people who are younger than myself, when I see people who are older than myself, because we, we act like everyone from older generations is conservative and against the grain, and that's just not true. There always have been people on the right side of history, and seeing those folks and experiencing them in, in real life, seeing them in the archives from the past and dreaming about them in the future make me hopeful. That's an awesome answer. Kathleen? I'm just going to plagiarize what they already said. Um, Working with students keeps me hopeful. Now, don't ask my partner, Robin, because I come home and complain every day. But, um, but that's about different stuff. That's about like not getting your stuff in on time. Um, but they are very interested and very active. Sometimes they don't know how to be active, and, and that's when they need a little bit of that roadmap that I was talking about before. Sometimes they do, though. Um, this really cool thing happened at ODU. The um, LGBTQ student group has connected with the university archivist because we were very lucky um, that some of the old student records got kept, mostly because one of the people who, um, don't tell anybody outside this room, but um, one of the people who worked in the archives had been in that student group and saved a lot of stuff and just kind of, you know, put them in the archives. Um, these flyers and things that were, uh, that are very valuable to us now. Well, um, because they had that beginning, and because we have a really great staff in the university archives, um, they have started actively archiving things. So they had an event three weeks ago, and my students, I took them into the archives, and one of my students is the president of that student group, and they were like, oh my God, our flyers are already in the archives. I couldn't believe it. Um, 
so anyway, that that's um, it's just a demonstration of how it matters to them and it's important. And um, I think they probably keep me hopeful. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Uh, as, as you potentially make your way to like one of the attendants here, will we'll bring it to you so you don't have to get up. But uh, I want to do a gentle reminder that we'd like attendees to share the questions during the question and answer, and the panelists will do their best to provide answers. But if you feel yourself moved to offer more of a comment, less of a question, please please know that we'll be available after the event for discussion up at the front. Um, so thank you, and, and we look forward to any questions you may have. It looks like we have one here. Okay, yeah, and <clears throat> I will introduce myself. I'm Beth Marshak, and I was active here in Richmond since the 1970s, and also um, co-wrote a book, Lesbian and Gay Richmond. Um, and uh, Jim Sears interviewed me, so I'm in his book. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask you to uh, join me in uh, figuring out uh, how to really encourage people to know that with both history and activism, there's still such a tendency to focus on what we see as the key people or the important people when really everyone has something to offer and is important. And that's certainly uh, with uh, archives, that's so very true, um, that having an understanding of what people's daily life is like is, is probably more important than what political activism they might have done. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to open it up for you all to talk about that some more. That's a great question. And, uh, do folks have any comments? I, I know that's one that we care a lot, a lot about the library in terms of the, the most powerful stories are not not the names that the, the elected officials, but the everyday people whose experiences are preserved in those records. So how can we do more to, to preserve that history? And maybe, maybe in Norfolk or ODU, they're, they're doing some things that you could talk about. Um, I'm so glad you asked. Uh, and I'm so glad to see you here. Um, um, it is something I have run into in particular. When I first started doing the work, I was like, I want to know where the lesbians were, right? Like, as a lesbian, I wanted to know lesbian history. Um, and I had to back off of that some because lesbians were like, I don't know. I was married to a man for 25 years. I don't really have anything to tell you. And I said, that's lesbian history. Um, I can't tell you how many lesbians were married to men for 25 years and had kids, right? Um, but they had this uh, idea that that they weren't gay enough, I guess, to be a part of gay history. And um, I can't, I haven't come up with a really good solution to this except to constantly say to people, your history matters. And one of the things that I say a lot, um, especially when I'm doing like grant writing and things, is it's wonderful to know the history, of the, gay, the queer history of New York and San Francisco and Miami. That is wonderful. But many more of us have lived in other places and our experiences aren't necessarily the same. We'll have some things in common, right? But um, if you think about the region of the United States right now where the most queer people live. Anybody know where it is? You know all the answers, Aurora. <laughs> yes, it's right here. It's the South, right? But but when we start to talk about the South and queerness, people are you like, get oh. another candy bar later. Yeah, exactly. I'm just gonna have to like buy stock and candy bars. Um, uh, but when you start to talk about queerness in the South, people are like, oh, you can't be queer in the South. And it's like, well, obviously you can because a whole bunch of us have been and continue to be for a long time. So um, I don't know. I guess I'm just saying it is a vitally important question. And what we have to keep doing is saying those individual stories matter. And um, if, if y'all indulge me to tell you, say one more thing, and then I promise I'll turn my mic off. Um, I interviewed in March a woman by the name of Jeanette Parham, and she is fascinating. I usually try to limit my uh, interviews to about an hour. Two and a half hours in, I was like, Jeanette, I gotta let you go. Um, but uh, I don't know how old she is. She says she's 39, and she's been 39 for the last 39 years, so. Uh, <laughs> You know, um, but she is like the, um, what was that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but she uh, actually opened 
uh, in Norfolk, Club Rumors, and Club Rumors 2, which was in Richmond, was also Jeanette's um, bar. But more important, I think, than that, and that was really wonderful. She's like, when I asked her to describe it, she was like, imagine Pose, but in Norfolk. And I was like, oh my God, that sounds wonderful. Um, but I think even more important than that, she coordinated all of these drag pageants and um, um, contests for butch black women um, who were like walking runways in their butch fashion. Um, in all different places, all over. Um, so it wasn't that there was necessarily a bar um, where this was happening. This was happening in people's houses and house parties. It was happening at the Holiday Inn. It was happening at like, there was one place, I forget what it was. It probably wasn't like an Elks Club, but it was something along those lines. I was like, man, y'all were just all over this city. But we, we don't know those kinds of stories because they aren't necessarily connected to something like, Beth, what you're saying, something like important. Um, you know, some some leader in the community, but they help us understand all of our history so much better. Kathleen, thank you. You're doing exactly what people need to be doing, I believe. I mean, talk, capturing the stories, teaching the young, the students. Uh, my answer to your question is just do it. I mean, we all have phones. We can all record stories. Get it down. This is what it was like to be a lesbian and be married and raise three kids and live in suburbia. I, here's, the, here's what I struggled with. I mean, I'm not talking about you personally. I'm just using this as an example. I mean, those are the stories we need and that scholars in the future will look to understand the unique journey that lesbians who get married have with their lives which is a different variation of the, or we have so many variations in our community, but that's just one, right? But that needs to be ex captured. And uh, so just do it. I mean, each and every one of us can be an archivist here. And we can, we can, we can capture stories and, and think about what in our life, you know, is, people would be in, is different and people would be interested in, in if they're writing a, a, a thesis in, in 20 years, or someone's trying to understand what it was like to be, uh, you know, a black gay young man in Richmond in in 2023. I mean, that's that's how we help record our history. Is we we all become historians, and and you know we particularly look for those older people like Kathleen did, who have unique stories. I mean, that's a great one. Talk about our parallel universe. You know, the black lesbian community is probably the least, uh, what's the right word, understood or? Uh, uh, most, erased. most erased is the right word uh, in our community. Do it. But she's only 39. But she's only 39. She's a millennial too. We're not known for our math skills. <laughs> are there any more questions in the audience? Um, By the way, can I just say, I feel like Beth would give us a really good answer to that question. Yeah, Beth, I mean, you, you wrote one of the quintessential books on history for Richmonders. Well, I think it's, it's just important to encourage everyone to tell their story and to, to um, <clears throat> contribute things like if they have a diary or if they have a collection of letters <clears throat> or whatever they may have that... Uh, you know, what they picked up when they went to the Pride celebration, the literature they picked up, whatever um, materials they might have, but their story especially. Um, and there are a lot more uh, people who are doing the oral histories. It's easier to find someone. <clears throat> I encourage people to contact the um, history departments of the colleges in their area and let them know that you are interested in being interviewed. Uh, because they're always looking for people. And uh, every time somebody contacts me, I say, yes, I'll be glad to be interviewed, but let me give you some names of other people <laughs> that you can also interview. Um, <clears throat> so let yourself be known. Um, don't think that, don't, don't buy into the idea that what um, you've done in your life is not as important as what someone else has done. It is, it is, and it's, 
it's very important to share that. <clears throat> and that's where our strength comes from, is from uh, finding the ways that we are really part of our larger community. We're part of the, the smaller communities that make up that larger community as well. And, um, and, and we're all important. We, we all add to that in so many ways. Um, don't underestimate yourself. I can't think of a better better way to end the evening with, with that encouragement from you, Beth. But I, I do want to take a second to give a, a hearty thanks, making sure we're okay on time, okay? And then give a hearty thanks to our panelists if you would help me thank them for their time this evening as well. And I have one last plug before you go into the evening, which is if, if you have flyers, if you have papers around your house that you think would be valuable, the library is interested in talking with you. There are staff here who you can connect with tonight. Uh, the research guide on the zine is also, there's contact information there. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Like uh, Jeff and others have said, we'll, we'll take anything and we'll see if there's value. And if there's so, we'd love to lovingly steward and preserve it for, for generations to come. Thank you so much for joining us this evening.